Warren King spent the majority of, professional, of his professional career as a trader and commodities broker at Cargill, gaining a deep understanding of the underlying fundamentals of the food system. Since leaving Cargill, Warren has worked as a consultant to numerous nonprofits and small businesses in the areas of food and natural products in the roles of researcher, contributor, and project manager. He has served as general manager of Goodness Greenest, the Midwest's largest certified organic produce wholesaler, and was appointed to serve on the state of Illinois' local organic food and farming task force. The principal of Wellspring Limited, Warren is managing the Praster Project, with the Wall Center to increase production of grass-fed beef in the Upper Midwest. Let me turn it over to Warren to tell you some more about that project. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, welcome everybody here, and hopefully you all have an easy time hearing me. And and we'll just uh, we'll just get right to it. Uh, Jeff, am I able to advance the slides? Yep. Just okay, um, thank you. The arrow, sure. So the project is focused on the Upper Midwest, and it is in the the project is working to develop a course or pathway that would grow pasture-based agriculture and provide opportunities for producers, processors, and a host of others along the supply chain. Uh, principally, we want to make sure that uh, this grass-based initiative is offering healthy food to consumers and it is focused on increasing the number of vulnerable acres that are under sustainable management. And vulnerable acres would be those that are highly erodible, uh, acres that are in riparian areas, uh, acres that are close to streams, uh, with the end result being cleaner surface and groundwater systems, and particularly in an effort to improve the, the water quality in the upper Mississippi water basin and to reduce or slow down greatly uh, the harmful algae bloom that we see on an annual basis in the Gulf of Mexico. So this is really a, a project that is focused on using pasture-based agriculture, the changes on the land as a way to improve uh, water quality, to provide good products to consumers, and to increase the opportunities for uh, everyone who's involved in the supply chain. A strategy within the pasture project is to develop compelling arguments are one of the strategies. We know that there are, is a lot of interest, uh, the number of people who signed up for this call and are on this call uh, certainly is evidence that there's a lot of interest uh, among farmers and ranchers and landholders in moving uh, current agricultural systems, current agricultural operations toward pasture-based agriculture. We also know there's been a lot of study and this is a great body of evidence that uh, pasture-based agriculture can help uh, provide alternatives to use of uh, chemical fertilizers, nitrogen and phosphor phosphorus, uh, which are the principal uh, pollutants in many of our water systems, particularly in our surface water and our groundwater, and again contribute greatly to the, the harmful algae bloom in the Gulf of Mexico. So what we want to do is we want to use these arguments to provide options uh, to row crop farmers, to uh, producers who today are using uh, cow-calf operators that are using confinement systems that would uh, help them to understand, uh, show them the economic, ecological uh, benefits uh, that would lower their costs help them to build soil organic matter, restore the, the soil microbial activity, and there's a growing body of evidence that moving away from re the reliance on nitrogen and, and phosphorus-based chemicals can actually increase yields and enhance revenues, uh, principally uh, enhancing revenues through uh, lowering costs. So for the past year and a half, uh, myself and a number of colleagues have been uh, 
involved in a research project that uh, has been around the uh, supply and demand of uh, the grass finished grass based beef industry. Uh, we have some key findings here. Uh, Alan Williams is going to talk a little bit more about that in his section of the uh, of this presentation in the webinar. But I wanted to put some of them in front of you right now. So the grass finished beef market is growing at 15 to 20 percent a year annually. And, and based on our research and projections, if the animal numbers are there, if the supply chain is adequate, uh, if the cost is at uh, a reasonable price for consumers, uh, potentially we could reach 22 percent of households with grass finished beef. That the supply of grass finished animals is a key limiting factor. And again, Alan will talk a bit about this uh, and as to why that is. And so what it's led us to is a focus on transition, a focus on production, and a focus on helping producers uh, put more animals on the land and finish more animals on grass. And we know that it's a, it's a process of, of transition. We did a half a dozen case studies in the last year of producers, um, some branded programs, some not, that have transitioned, excuse me, transitioned to grass finishing uh, beef. And every single, single one of those, in fact, was a transition. It didn't happen overnight. It took a number of years. And, and the producers and those who were supporting them had to develop a number of skills for that to happen. We also know that the producers are, in fact, lowering costs and they're increasing their margins. And many, many of them are participating higher up the value chain in raising cattle on grass. For instance, uh, moving from cow-calf operations to finishers, uh, moving from cow-calf operators to actually branded programs, uh, moving from cow-calf operators to supplying branded programs. So there's a, a host of ways in which producers are participating, and again, uh, seeing higher prices, uh, seeing better margins, and again, participating higher up the value chain. Our case studies also show that producers need options. Again, that there's, this is not a one-size-fits-all. Uh, like every business, uh, farm businesses are different. The skills of the operators are different. The, the type of equipment they have is different, uh, and particularly the land on which they're raising animals in some cases is very, very different. And it takes time and some effort and a bit of skill development to learn how to successfully transition from the operations that you have today to an operation that, in fact, finishes animals on grass. Another key finding of our research is that of producer networks. Producer networks are extremely important. Uh, it gives producers opportunities for, for mentoring and dialogue and technical assistance. It also gives them opportunities to form uh, collaboratives, uh, networks, marketing alliances. And our last presenter, Greg Nowicki, will talk about a, a producer's cooperative in the Midwest that allow them to uh, go to the market together to gain some efficiencies in the marketplace that they can't or, or are very, very difficult for them to achieve if they are uh, producing on their own, if they're by themselves. The other key finding of our research is that policy and communication play important roles in supporting this, this system-wide chain that we're change that we're talking about and moving toward alternative production systems in the beef industry, that there are policies that uh, hamper transition uh, all the way from um, farm policy around commodities to uh, policies and practices within uh, groups like uh, uh, FSA and NRCS uh, and others that actually uh, can make it a bit more difficult for, for farmers to make uh, this transition. And we also know that the communication eventually, if not already, is playing a very key role 
that there are many actors along the supply chain, and some of those not very active sometimes. Uh, we have land landowners that are not uh, involved in farming operations. They have farm managers. Uh, there are lenders and investors who really don't know very much about this segment of the market and, and its potential and its financials and the opportunities that exist. So our project will also be focusing on uh, developing the messages and targeting messages toward key, key audiences that can play and are playing supportive roles in the transition to alternative production systems. So currently the project is involved in uh, the development of five pilots to test, if you will, some of the strategies and recommendations that came out of our findings. I, I won't go through this whole list. Uh, you'll be able to, uh, to get a copy of this. I think there's, there's a couple of them that are very key. Uh, one is that you know, we want to take a whole system approach to creating solutions. And to do that, we've put together an advisory committee that represents people from all along the supply chain, uh, producers, processors, retailers, uh, marketers, branded programs, uh, distributors that supply food service, distributors that supply retail. Uh, and so we, we believe that uh, by doing that, uh, that we get the benefit of their experience and their knowledge. They're involved in the marketplace every day and we can, it'll help us to translate whatever recommendations or solutions or the evaluations of our pilots into things that are market-based and things that are sustainable, replicable, and resilient. Uh, secondly, we want to reach producers of all types and in various stages of transition. And this includes row crop producers. As I said earlier, there's a growing body of evidence that the incorporation of uh, rotational grazing, uh, soil microbial amendments, and other types of practices can greatly reduce the amount of chemical uh, nitrogen and phosphorus inputs, e even weed killer uh, inputs into commodity farming without having any adverse impact on yields, in fact, enhancing yields and lowering costs. So part of our communication plan and our communication strategy will include uh, how we can, as a project, start to uh, create dialogue with producers who are not, uh, they're not producing animals and yet they can be a very integral, integral part of the supply chain and the value chain in doing so. So with that, I would like to uh, turn the next segment over to Alan Williams. Uh, Dr. Williams is a founding partner and the president of Livestock Management Consultants. Livestock Management Consultants uh, specializes in food and uh, farm companies, sustainability and profitability uh, through values-based value chain development and marketing uh, with a, a key specialization in grass-fed beef production. Uh, Alan's a sixth generation farmer and uh, spent 15 years as an academic uh, doing research teaching and working in extension. He is, uh, has written over 200 articles that have been peer-reviewed. In, uh, in 2000, Alan uh, left academia and founded LMC. And since then, he's worked with over 3,000 farmers and ranchers uh, in the United States, Canada, Canada, Mexico, and South America, and acts as a consultant with processors, distributors, retailers, and, and food service uh, companies all up and down the supply chain. Alan is currently serving as the chairman of the Association of Family Farms. He is on the executive committee of the Grassfed Exchange. And Alan works along with me as a technical advisor and co-project leader of the Pasture Project. And he's a member of the USDA BFR DP EAT program. So Alan, I uh, thanks for being on the call with us today. and. Uh, I'd ask you to continue on.
Thank you, Warren. Appreciate it very much. Um, what we're going to do now is run through uh, in the next 15 minutes uh, just a, at least an overview of what we have discovered in our market channel analysis. I know 15 minutes is a very short time to cover what is a very broad and detailed topic. So we will basically point out some highlights this afternoon. And obviously, if there's additional detail that any of you want to uh, access, we will do our best to provide that detail to you. Now, if we look at current status, just sort of a broad overview of current status and background of the grass-fed industry in the United States, there are currently a number of branded programs in the grass-fed sector, with most of these having started within the past five to eight years. There are several of these programs that are older than that, but the vast majority that are in existence today are within that time frame in terms of uh, initiation and in implementation of their program. For the majority of these branded programs, their weekly harvest ranges from less than 20 head to more than 100 head per week. They are selling into a number of different sectors. These include the retail grocery sector, restaurants, institutional food service, and e-commerce. Most of the brands that are, that are providing grass-fed beef today do have a unique story and a place-based history, and they utilize that story and that history in their marketing and promotion, as well they should. There are differences, certainly, in product quality grade and, and consistency within these programs. And there's also differences within these programs in terms of supplements that are allowed. Some of these programs are certified, and some are not. For those that are certified, the primary certifications are American Grass-Fed Association, the USDA Grass-Fed PVP, or Process Verified Program, the Animal Welfare Approved Certification, and Food Alliance Certification. If we take a look at what we have identified as our primary growth channels for grass-fed beef in the United States, uh, first, we find that over the last 15 years, we have certainly seen exponential growth in the grass-fed sector. Retail sales for 2011 were well over a billion dollars looking at both domestic and imported retail sales combined. Now, to put this in perspective, approximately 75 to 80 percent of those of those sales, retail sales, are from imported product, with the balance being from domestic grass-fed beef production. Now, this does tell us that we have enormous opportunity domestically to expand our sales because, again, 75% plus of all the current sales are coming from imported grass-fed beef. Grocery sales currently are to mostly upscale retailers. However, we are now seeing a number of what I'll term mass market regional and national chains. And these are chains such as Hy-Vee, uh, Kroger, and so forth that are actively testing grass-fed beef within certain regions. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I think it was two weeks ago, Nolan Ryan, All Natural Beef, announced in partnership with Kroger that they are actively marketing grass-fed beef in the southwest region for Kroger stores. Another area where we have seen tremendous penetration is in the restaurant sector. And we have actually seen grass-fed sales up and down the entire sector, ranging from QSR or quick service or fast food restaurants 
all the way up to fine dining. Now, most of what we find currently in the, what I'll call, the again, the QSR, the fast food, and the fast casual, in terms of grass-fed, that product is in what we, will, we would have to term sort of local and regional upscale QSR in fast casual establishments. It hasn't spread yet to the broader sector, and obviously one of the major factors in that regard is price point. Institutional food service has also made great use of grass-fed beef within the last few years. We now see grass-fed beef throughout the country in some hospital cafeterias, university and school district cafeterias, and even corporate cafeterias. Now let's take a look at a few facts and some bottlenecks within the grass-fed sector. First of all, our research tells us that the primary consumer reasons for purchasing grass-fed beef are that the beef is antibiotic, hormone, animal byproduct, and grain-free. That all of these animals are raised without these supplements and medications. Also, they want a beef product that addresses their environmental concerns, their concerns about animal health and welfare, and their concerns about human health. The cattle that are being used predominantly in the grass-fed sector are primarily English-influenced and mostly moderate-framed. And those are certainly the type of cattle, both phenotypically and genotypically, that are finishing best on forage under two years of age or within two years of age. Currently, finished cattle, grass-finished cattle, are selling approximately $20 to $30 above commodity-fed cattle on a live weight basis. And this has been fairly consistent as a price range premium over the last three to four to five years within the industry. The greatest needs or bottlenecks that we find in the industry are the need to proliferate the type of genetics, the type and kind of genetics that work best in this production scenario, the development of professional forage finishing, and we'll talk just a little bit more about that in a moment, control of producer cost of production and cost of production beyond the farm and ranch gate, and the establishment of greater economies of scale. We do know that the cattle are there. It's not, a, it's not a matter of the cattle not existing in the population. It's a matter of how those cattle are raised so that they qualify for grass-fed programs and how those cattle are allocated in terms of which market uh, they are allocated to. We also know through our research that the processing is there if, and that's, this is a big if, if the scale is adequate. Okay, so what do we need in the grass-fed sector? Well, first of all, again, we know that processing is available at a reasonable cost, and that's really important for control of cost of production beyond the farm and ranch gate if our branded programs are working in load lots with adequate numbers of cattle. Where we have our challenges currently in terms of processing and further processing and cost of processing is when we're working with smaller numbers. And in that case, we do have some issues in terms of being able to locate USDA inspected plants that have the capability of producing product to NAMP specs that can be sold on the wholesale box beef market. Now, many producers out there currently that are attempting to do grass-fed beef also have an issue with their cost of production. They have to develop plans that are and strategies that are going to allow them to gain greater control over their cost of production from conception to market and certainly better forage and grazing management. 
Now, likewise, our branded programs also need to do a better job of developing control of their cost of production. This is the only way that we're going to be able to achieve price points that are going to allow significant growth of this market because we all know that there certainly is a consumer threshold that we have to deal with. The greatest identified current bottleneck in our industry is the lack of large-scale professional level forage finishing. This is a must-have for the establishment of economies of scale. The development of professional forage finishing allows us to have much more consistent year-round finishing of grass-fed cattle for a fresh beef 24-7 market. It allows us the ability to sort up cattle on a daily and weekly basis so that every time we load a truck going to the processing plant, we have cattle that are very uniform in both degree of finish and live weight. It also allows the finisher and the owners of the cattle opportunities for alternative marketing options. If they have some cattle that tend to sort of fall out of the grass-fed program, so to speak, and they, you know, and we all know that there are certain cattle that just simply will not perform like they should on forages, then if we have a number of these cattle grouped at a professional finisher, we have the ability to put them on a truck in a load lot and send them into a feedlot situation or whatever for finishing there into an all-natural grain-fed market where they can still capture some significant premiums on those cattle. Additionally, these forage finishers need to be located within a reasonable distance to processing so that we can lower transport costs of fully finished cattle. We also need more producers who are willing to transition to this type of production. And as Warren mentioned earlier, last year we conducted a number of producer case studies that provide compelling evidence for that transition. Now, progress and market needs. We know that our industry has progressed significantly in the past decade. We have more grass-fed cattle available today than we did 10 years ago. We have more grass-fed producers that are speculatively finishing grass-fed cattle, which is an absolute necessity for growth of the market. They're finishing these cattle and obtaining bids from a number of different branded programs. That was something that we really didn't have available to us 10 years ago. We have significantly more branded programs in the marketplace today. And one of the things that I'm seeing and that I really appreciate is that the fact that a number of these branded programs are collaboratively working together in sharing product and market access. We, we're seeing a number of established branded programs now entering the grass-fed sector. This includes programs such as Maverick Ranch, Meyer Natural Angus, Nolan Ryan, and many others. Due to this fact that we have established branded programs entering the sector that is also increasing the demand for boxed grass-fed beef products because a lot of these established programs rely, rather than buying the whole animal, they rely on buying box beef to satisfy their market sectors. The grass-fed sector is closely mimicking the all-natural sector in growth. And if you go back and you look at the history of the development of the all-natural sector, you'll see that we're following the same trend lines. There will be some consolidation and strategic mergers occur within the grass-fed sector. And this year, there are already a handful of those in the works. There are several new major entrants to the grass-fed sector, again, with most of these looking for box beef programs. And there are several new major distribution and retail entrants to this market sector. However, with our distributors and our retail partners, 
there are several things that we need. First of all, we need better growth and marketing strategies. A lot of times what we're seeing is that our distributors and retailers are trying to market the grass fed and introduce it into the market very similarly to commodity products. And that is not conducive to rapid market growth. We need better product education both to our distribution sales partners and our meat department partners in the retail grocery sectors, and we need additional marketing collateral. Also, our distribution and retail meat department partners need to develop, and, and obviously this is something that we play a vital role in, we need to help them develop a greater understanding of the stage at which we're at in the development of the grass-fed sector. And what I mean by that is that all of these distributors and retailers are very well trained by our large commodity programs for just-in-time delivery of exactly what they want. And at this stage in the grass-fed sector, that is still not fully possible. So we have to have a little bit of more, a little bit more give and take at this stage until we most more fully develop. And likewise, though, we need the sales from this sector to spur the revenue needed to more fully develop the sector. In addition, we need better carcass utilization, and we need additional willingness to work with price points. So in summary, we find that over the last decade, growth has been significant in this sector, and the consumer interest is certainly there. We are closely following the all-natural model that started about 25 years ago. Our major bottlenecks are cost of production, both on the producer side and the branded program side. Forage finishing, we need to develop professional level forage finishers load lots of cattle going to the plant, and further development of economies of scale. We need more producers to transition to facilitate this growth, and we need better carcass utilization in marketing and an understanding in the distribution and retail sectors of where we are at this stage in the development of the grass-fed sector. And we always have to remember that we have to deliver product at a reasonable cost to the consumer. Thank you, Warren. Warren, you may be still muted. Sorry. I understand you guys. Can you hear me now? As I said. Okay, and yep. Alan, thank you for that. I appreciate it very much. Uh, and from the numbers of questions that you have coming in, uh, I know we'll get we'll circle back here uh, once Greg's had his presentation and be able to to have a look at that. Uh, so our next presenter is Greg Nowicki. Uh, Greg is the president, of the board of directors of the Wisconsin Grass Fed Beef Cooperative as well uh, as a producer member. Uh, Greg has a small cow-calf uh, finishing operation, and he also markets direct uh, free-range broilers. He's a fifth-generation uh, farmer, and is he and his wife, Lisa, and their daughter, Anna, are running a forage-based operation in central Wisconsin. And Greg spent 17 years in manufacturing and production, uh, excuse me, construction management prior becoming a full-time farmer and has served in the U.S. Air Force. So Greg, uh, again welcome and uh, please uh, continue on with your presentation. Thank you, Warren. Appreciate the intro. Uh, I plan on uh, giving everybody some history and some uh, information about how our co-op started and where we currently we are. We uh, back in 2006 and 7, the Wisconsin Department of Ag sponsored some 
listening sessions and uh, attracted a, quite a few producers to these sessions. Um, the producers that attended were, a lot of them were already uh, direct marketing and may have been looking for an additional outlet. Um, a lot of the other producers were uh, producers that felt they they had a good product but didn't want to get into the marketing side of it. Um, they either lacked time, knowledge, or skills needed to uh, move beyond any direct marketing or even, even get into it. So through that, um, the idea of, of a, gr a grower's co-op was formed, and we spent about two years uh, in a do-it-yourself development process which ultimately led to the Wisconsin Grass-Fed Beef Cooperative and, and our brand, the Wisconsin Meadows brand, uh, starting in uh, January of 2009. Through the development process, uh, the producers interviewed um, prospective buyers in, in our market to get a, a market-based perception of, of quality of grass finished beef. Um, most of the concern always revolved around consistency. Uh, what we ended up, what developed out of that was our, our a humane production protocol standard to ensure consistency. We have a, a fairly strict protocol. Uh, including rate of gain standards. Um, the we highly encourage the English-based breeds. Uh, no dairy influence at all in the cattle. We're pretty strict also about the uh, use of pesticides, um, antibiotics, hormones, all of that stuff is banned. The uh, other thing that we felt was unique was we adopted a born and raised in Wisconsin standard for all of the cattle that will be marketed under this brand. We, we felt that was very important and something that would set us apart from the other brands that were out there. And we believe there's a, a competitive difference in brands that promote local, local beef from local farm families. Some of the, the key transition steps were promoting grass finishing as less expensive, more envi environmentally friendly, and improving animal health. Uh, we, we did the formation work for this whole co-op uh, ourselves, uh, basically as a, as a cost containment measure. And the development of the protocol by the producers as we were going about this really encouraged the commitment and um, it, it solidified the, the fact that we, we believed we were, we were putting together a good protocol that would be uh, uh, embraced by the, by the producers as we went, as we got going. Currently, we have 80 uh, members in our co-op. Again, this, this started in 2009. I think the first year we had right around 50 members, and uh, we've been adding 10 or so, 10 or 15 members a year. So the, the growth is there. Um, members aren't required to sell their animals to the co-op. Like I said earlier, a lot of the members already do their own direct marketing uh, right right in their local area, and you know we didn't want to discourage that. Members are also responsible for getting their cattle to market. We we don't we don't haul the cattle for them, and our our processor is in the southern part of 
Wisconsin. Many of our producers are four to six hours away. So that that is a, a bit of a burden on our on our far away producers, and that's that's an issue that we've been working on addressing over the last two to three years, and and we feel we we've got some ideas to to help those people out. We do use a local USDA inspected processor, and we are currently selling in, in uh, Illinois and Minnesota also, besides Wisconsin. We use, in order to keep our, our costs down, uh, we use a part-time sales and production manager that pretty much run all of the day-to-day -day operations of the business. With the, the volume we, we currently have, they're able to do that. Um, long term, we know that's not the ultimate answer, but for, for where we are now, it, it's very important that we are able to contain our costs, and that's this has allowed us to do that. Uh, our current challenges, I, and some of these aren't current, some of them have been challenges since, since day one, but uh, the biggest challenge we have is what Alan was alluding to also, the, the shortage of grass-finished cattle uh, market-wide. Many of the other branded programs in the area are, that w are all going after the same cattle right now. Um, we are in need of cold storage space that that's a tough one to to handle our processor doesn't have a lot of cold storage space and we've we've been working with some of our other uh, associates to, to make sure that we if if we need space we have it uh, typically we don't keep a lot of product in stock uh, in fact right now we have none um, everything it's processed and it's it's delivered to the customers but there is times when we need we do need storage. Um, we've always been self-funded through their own cash flow, which is uh, in the past has been a rather large challenge from our producer standpoint because they were the ones that ultimately ended up having to wait for their for the cash for their cattle that they sent us. Um, we are getting through that now. We we have been getting some funding from our producer members, which has helped to even that out and uh, has helped us make some improvements in our turnaround time for, for payment. Another thing is, as I, I said earlier, we we have producers all over the state and our processor is in the southern part of the state, so we, we try to work with the producers and, and gather cattle from an area of the state, if at all possible, to, to fill out a cycle. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, during the uh, times of the year when when the grass finished cattle are are in low supply, we we do struggle to put together full loads. Uh, pricing and payment policy. We there were times early on where we were quite a bit behind the market as the market was rising. We were losing some of our cattle to the conventional market because our, our pricing wasn't keeping up with the market. We've we've since put measures in place to make sure that we're we're at our the premium that we want to pay above the market and that has uh, made a big difference in, in terms of being able to go with confidence to our producers and, and know, that, know that we've got a price they're going to want to sell to us. The keeping pace with demand right now uh, on, on any cycle we could be using two to three more head. Uh, the demand is there. We have a, a good marketing team uh, pounding the pavement and getting us in with, with the right outlets so 
again, this goes back to the shortage of grass-finished cattle. Some of our successes, as I said earlier, also uh, differentiate brand. We felt it was very important that um, we were local and Wisconsin. We felt the Wisconsin name uh, was carried a lot of weight, and our, our customers tell us that. We, we've always managed to keep a very low cost structure. We've, in the th three years, we've almost four years we've been in business now, we've, we have very little debt. And we plan to stay that way. We, we really want to work off of, off of our profits that we're, we're seeing now and uh, maintain our growth that way. We, we have a competitive sales price. We're not the cheapest out there, we know that, but for the, for the product we deliver, we have a good price. We have a very talented team of, of individuals that are, are moving our product and working to, from a, from a business standpoint, to uh, keep us between the guardrails. Uh, we have a board of directors that's very engaged. They're all producer members and very passionate about what we are, are uh, attempting to do and we meet monthly. Uh, the board is statewide, so most of our, our meetings are via teleconference, and we meet with the, the management of the co-op. And uh, the, the meetings are long. We've had a lot of very tough discussions over the last three to four years, and uh, everybody's pretty much stuck with it, and, and uh, that shows the commitment of our board. And finally, we're getting to the point where we're, we're profitable. We had some pretty shaky years in the beginning, but right now it, it's, it's going good for us. Um, we've been able to keep our head above water for, for quite a while. So that ultimately, that's where we need to be. That's that's kind of where we are with the co-op right now as we're, as this relates to the pilot project. Um, some of our key points recommending changes to our current business leading to a replicable, replicable model that can be implemented throughout multiple regions. So uh, we're going to be doing some uh, surveys of our membership, uh, make sure we have accurate data on herd sizes, acreage, breeds, finishing skills, and such. Uh, we're going to be identifying strengths and weaknesses in our current model that, uh, and, and develop a strategy to improve, uh, address processing challenges that we, we know have to be um, resolved before we can grow a whole lot more. Uh, we need to do a better job of uh, carcass data collection carcass quality, baseline establishment, and identify key market channels to facilitate our growth. And finally, uh, assess our current marketing strategy and modify to improve efficiency and end product quality, uniformity, and packaging. We need to focus on increasing the grass-fed beef supply. Uh, you know, this is kind of the reoccurring theme of, of this webinar, but for, for, our, for the co-op and for for the other grass-fed programs, increase the number of cooperatives producing grass-fed beef would be a goal. And we want to develop a skill set needed for growth of professional forage finish finishers to address the bottleneck in the grass-fed sector. Um, that that's going to be a big challenge and a lot of work, but we're per we're on board with with knowing that that has to happen in order to resolve the issues that we struggle with right now. And we need to uh, determine how many forage finishers we're going to need to supply our current and, and planned growth of the co-op. Uh, and then detail or develop a detailed training manual, materials for custom forage finishing 
including uh, year-round forage sequencing and supplements, average daily gain parameters, grazing management, stored forages, cattle sorting, and such. And then we would ultimately conduct training sessions for our members that are interested in becoming custom finishers in support of the co-op. This may include uh, actual site visits to current uh, professional forage finishers and involve current forage finishers who have a, a proven track record. You want to be able to develop templates and co-op policy on how custom finishing will be handled. So those are those are our goals through the through the pilot project. Thank you, Greg. Um, uh, there's a, a question here for you. Um, Bob asks, how many animals are currently marketed through the co-op? Right now, we're processing about 15 head every other week. So we're on, we're on the small side. OK. Um, uh, there are a few questions here. Uh, uh, let me just mention, um, this is wonderful. There are m many, many questions. Um, so we might not be able to get to everyone, but uh, but please keep them coming. Um, and um, thanks for that. Um, there are a couple questions about uh, defining what a professional forage uh, finisher is um, and, and how is it different from um, so, some other uh, forage system. Um, and uh, there's also a question around that. Um, that's part of the same question. Um, what is being done to uh, assess, research, and facilitate professional forage finishing systems? OK, uh, this, this is Alan. Um, and I, I would be happy to address that. First of all, when we're talking about a professional forage finisher, we are talking about someone who is finishing cattle uh, on a both on a custom basis, and they're bringing in uh, you know other outside animals, whether they are through retained ownership or through direct purchase to finish for branded programs. Uh, this is very different from an individual cow calf producer who also is finishing their own calf crop. Uh, you know that that's just simply an additional enterprise within their cow calf operation, and it in fact at times can actually take away from their cow calf operation because if they're going to also finish animals on that same land, then they're going to have to reduce the number of cow units that they carry annually in order to accommodate keeping animals all the way out to you know, a finishing age of approximately two years. So in terms of a professional forage finisher, we are looking for people that, again, the, the calves would be shipped in to them after weaning or at yearling stage, anywhere in that, in that timetable. So you would have lighter weight cattle where you could put larger numbers on a single truck and ship them into the finisher. Uh, you would have pooling and aggregation of cattle from a number of different producer sources. And the finisher, their responsibility would be to finish cattle on a year-round basis. And this would require that they have the ability to produce both high-quality perennials and annuals as well as stored forage feedstuffs that they can use on a year-round basis. Uh, one of the advantages, we went over several advantages of this earlier. You know, obviously, we have the greater aggregation of cattle so that we can sort up each week for uniform, consistent loads of cattle. We have greater marketing opportunities. We capture some additional economies of scale. And for the forage finisher, so those that choose to participate in this particular aspect of production, it actually offers them some opportunity financially because if they're professionally forage finishing, they'll get to a point where they're selling loads of cattle every week. 
they get a paycheck every week instead of one paycheck a year from a single calf crop a year. Uh, so they have much more consistent cash flow in and out on a consistent basis, you know, uh, uh, compared to uh, typical cow-calf operations. So again, we're talking about a larger scale operation where they are finishing cattle, uh, congregating and aggregating cattle for finish, allowing us to capture economies of scale and some production efficiencies. Alan, can you put um, uh, some sort of number on what you mean by larger scale? Well, it can be anywhere from a few hundred cattle finished annually to more than a thousand. Uh, you know, obviously, if you're doing less than a hundred head a year, finishing, first of all, your your revenue that you generate. Uh, you know, unless you're direct marketing those cattle, the, the revenue that you generate is uh, is likely not going to be sufficient to be a standalone enterprise. Uh, secondly, you're not finishing enough cattle on an annual basis to be able to sort up and put together reasonable, highly consistent load lots. So anywhere from several hundred to over a thousand head finished annually. Okay, great. That's that's a good guideline. Um, Melissa asks uh, what is perhaps uh, one of the uh, key questions. I, I really want to get to it, uh, and I'm going to use her words. Uh, are profits and margins with grass-fed operations even close to that which the conventional corn-growing producers can get? In other words, can a farmer with 100 acres make more money growing finishing grass-fed beef or growing conventional corn? Growing grass-fed beef versus growing conventional corn. Right, growing that so not having an animal operation, but just growing the corn. Okay, okay, all right. I wanted wanted to make sure I understood that question. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the the obvious answer is it depends. Uh, you know, and there, you know, I frankly I would have to have a lot more information to be able to adequately answer that question. Uh, so, so the general answer is this. Can it be equal to or even exceed that of growing corn in terms of net profit per acre? Yes, it can. Uh, but you know, to qualify that answer, it, it depends greatly on the productivity of that land for corn production. Is it 120, 140 bushel an acre dry land? Is it 200, 240 bushel an acre irrigated? Uh, you know, what are their input costs for the corn crop and that type of thing? You know, I do know that this year, and, and I work with a substantial number of farmers, row crop farmers around the country, and I do know that this year a very large number of them, uh, you know, are looking at $5 plus cost, you know, on a per bushel basis, uh, you know, in in putting that corn in. So unless corn is six dollars a greater a bushel, you know, they're probably at best at a break-even status. So you know, there there's a lot of give and take there, and a lot of relativity uh, that has to be answered. But uh, but in general, yes, they can they can anticipate returning as much net revenue as you can with corn done properly. Okay. Greg, um, I have a, a question uh, for you. Um, Alice asks, uh, what measures did you put in place pricing-wise to keep up with the market and asks, could that be coordinating price strategy? Um, and um, to, to use some food system terminology, do you, uh, I'm going to add this, do you feel like you are a a price maker or a price taker? Um, the the beginning of your question, Jeff. I didn't I didn't hear the first couple. Okay. Um, so uh, what the question is? Sure. What measures did you put in place uh, to quote keep up with the market in terms of price? Okay. Um, what we did is we, we pegged a certain market that uh, we would 
basically the, each Monday, the Monday of each, uh, of each week, we would look at the price of a, a certain market, and if it moved, we, we set parameters. If it moved a certain amount, we would adjust our price accordingly to maintain the, the spread that we want to provide to our producers above the conventional market. And we've been doing that since late last year and it seems to be working pretty well. So we're, we, we're basically uh, pegging the conventional market and then uh, adding a premium to that to, to determine our price. Okay, good. Does that make sense? Yeah, very helpful. The other, <laughs> there's another question here as well uh, concerning uh, types of breeds that are currently being used, you've, uh, Alan, I know have made reference, uh, and I think I have as well, to, to English breeds. Are there any, any specific uh, breeds that, that you're finding that uh, producers, uh, farmers and ranchers are turning toward to be efficient uh, users of grass? Warren, it's, um, it's more really in the type and bloodlines excuse me, than it is um, specific breeds. You know, certainly a lot of Angus and Red Angus are being utilized. Uh, there's quite a bit of Galloway and Devon that are being utilized in, in uh, grass head production out there currently, as well as Hereford. Uh, but in terms of, you know, just naming a breed and, and designating that breed as working better than others, that's not the case. Um, what we have found, and you know, and I've I've got an awful lot of carcass data and live animal performance data for over the past 10 to 15 years in this sector. And what we have found is that you you certainly can't designate a single breed as the do-all end-all in grass fed. You have to look at very specific bloodlines within those breeds, and and that's that's what we do. Okay, thank you, Alan. Uh, Greg, this is a, a question, and again, if it's been asked and answered, I apologize, uh, around ownership. Uh, how does the Wisconsin Grass-Fed Beef Cooperative uh, handle ownership? When do they take possession of the, of the cattle? And any insight about payment to producers? Okay, we take ownership of the cattle and they're delivered to the processor. So the Again, like I, I alluded to in the presentation, the, the producer is responsible for getting the cattle to the processor, and at that point, the co-op takes ownership. Uh, our, our payment policy is that we would pay in 14 days from the date of delivery. Um, that's that's where we struggled for years to hit that number. We're, we're just now getting to the point where we're uh, getting our, our payment down very close to that 14-day window. And uh, we we spent a lot of time communicating with our producers to make sure they under, understood our situation, and, and they've all been very patient and understanding, knowing what it's like to, to start a business. So it, it's worked out well. Does that answer okay, the question? Okay, thanks, Greg. Uh, we've got a couple. I, I think so. Yes. Thank you. Uh, we only got well, two or three more minutes here. Alan, uh, here's one from Joe. Uh, specific challenges uh, in grass finishing uh, relative to uh, meat grades and qualities. I know there's some differences uh, between how grass-fed beef is, is characteristically looked at as uh, from quality versus uh, uh, grain-fed beef. Uh, but are there any specific challenges? And, and what are uh, what are programs doing to, to make sure there aren't any surprises uh, for the producer or for themselves uh, once once the beef is harvested? Okay. Well, there as I explained earlier uh, when we were going through the slide presentation, there are definite differences among some of the grass-fed programs. Concerning the degree of finish, 
and so forth, and what what the cattle will weigh when they're finished on a live weight basis. Um, you know, some of the programs are targeting a fairly lean product, and so basically what they're doing is they're trying to assure that they have a product that's going to uh, be the equivalent of a USDA quality grade of low to mid select in their programs, and they really don't want to go over mid to high select in terms of degree of marbling. We have other programs that are looking at a more of a choice type product, and so they want grass finished cattle that are very well finished and that have a heavy live weight before they're harvested. And they are targeting a high select and up type of market. Uh, so there are differentiations in the branded programs and in the marketplace in terms of what people are producing and what they're looking for. Uh, the average live weight for the lean cattle is going to be in the neighborhood of 1050 to 1150 when they're harvested. The average live weight for the heavy cattle, or what I'll term the well-finished cattle that will grade high select, low choice, mid choice, are going to be 1,200 to 1,350 on the average when they're harvested. Now, what they're doing, and, and again, this is uh, why we need you know, more large-scale professional forage finishers, is you know, they're relying on a number of individual finishers uh, that with the vast majority of those also being cow calf producers to do the finishing for them. And you know, some programs are just simply doing an eyeball on the cattle. And and you know, if, if the cattle look finished enough, then they're okaying them to go to the plant. Uh, other programs are requiring the use of technologies such as ultrasound uh, to help them determine adequate degrees of back fat and marbling and so forth uh, before the cattle are harvested. So you know, it's, it's not super sophisticated yet, and there's a lot of hit and miss out there. And again, therefore, the need for a higher level of professionalism in the finishing end of this thing. OK, thank you, Alan. Uh, Jeff, I notice uh, we're at 3.45, I believe, we're, this is our end time. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you need to, uh, to do here to wrap up? Uh, yeah. I That's, not getting to all your questions. Yeah, there are uh, an overwhelming uh, number of questions, which is, which is terrific. Um, and uh, we, we will try to um, figure out a way to get to some more, more questions after the webinar. But let me, let me take people out, um, let people know um, about upcoming um, uh, uh, events. I want to thank Warren, Alan, and Greg. Your uh, different perspectives on this topic really helped to make a fuller picture of the market and how to tap that market potential. Uh, this webinar is being recorded um, and will be archived on our site along with the 40 other webinars we've done in the past. Please uh, feel free to send others who you think would like to have heard this panel to ngfn.org slash webinars and note that our uh, webinars are organized by topic, um, so you may consider uh, browsing our archives as well. This webinar should be up within a few business days, um, uh, and um, great. Uh, we offer our webinars every third Thursday of each month. Uh, the next webinar is um, the market and other benefits of transitioning to grass-based dairy, so a complement to this webinar. Again, uh, we'll have a case study um, and an introduction to an apprenticeship program designed to effectively get new and transitioning ranchers up to speed on different intensive management techniques. Um, so um, I want to let you know about three other Wallace Center websites. Foodhub.info is a food hub hub of information, research, case studies, a map of many of the food hubs across the country, uh, even links to TA providers, technical assistance providers with experience in aggregation and distribution. If you yourself are a technical assistance provider 
or a consultant on this call, you should take some time to uh, create or update your profile on ngfn.org. Um, I also want to note for consultants and technical assistance providers that uh, there's a question for you in the post-webinar survey. HUFED.org is our site for the Healthy Urban Food Enterprise Development Center. Uh, also run by the Wall Center. This program and its website is focused on increasing access to food to underserved, underserved communities using market-based solutions. Um, HughFed.org and FoodShedGuide.org is our site for producers wanting to adapt to the changing food business landscape. We have instructive tests, text and case studies with an emphasis on how to have a viable business in a food value chain. Learn about, for instance, factors to consider when deciding on legal status. Visit FoodShedGuide.org for more. You can find the NGFN on YouTube, on Twitter, and on our website, ngfn.org. The Wallace Center is now also on Facebook. Come like us. Search for Wallace Center at Wimrock International. If you haven't already, sign up for our email updates. There's a link on the ngfn.org homepage, or just let us know in the post-webinar survey, which will pop up right after this webinar ends. We'll, we'll sign you up. We'll be glad to. Contact us again at any time. Email address is contact at ngfn.org. The NGFN would like to thank you for your time again. And once again, let me encourage you to fill out the survey that will open your web browser. And please note the last question if you are a technical assistance provider or consultant interested in working with the National Good Food Network or the Wall Center. Thank you to our panelists, and thank you to you. Uh, our attendees, this concludes the webinar.